For many years, the photo industry has been filled with photographers that started out in film, but then got into digital. And in the past couple of years, what we've actually been seeing is pretty much the reverse. Photographers that start out in digital, and then they go and they want to experiment with film. Um, if it isn't standard 35 or 120 film and negative film and slide film, then it's something like daguerreotypes or wet plate collodions or cyanotype or something like that. Either way, you can't really deny the fact that analog photography is growing and will most likely continue to grow over the next couple of years. Here are a couple of tips for digital photographers that are getting into analog. Number one, film is balanced to daylight. In digital photography, you have the ability to use an auto white balance setting, which will usually get the colors pretty right for you most of the time. But film is always either balanced to daylight and some of it's balanced to tungsten light. If you want to get some sort of preview, then take your digital camera set it to daylight white balance mode if you can, or if you have it, and just go ahead and shoot. See what it'll look like. When you scan the photo later on, most scanners won't really give you the best quality that you can possibly get whenever you try to shift the color balance or the tint or something like that. So that's why a lot of photographers back in the day actually shot with color filters instead. Color filters went in front of your lens, or sometimes they went in between the film plane and your lens, and they shift the color in one way or another. Some photographers also sometimes took the same color gels that they used for flash and put them in front of the lens. The trade-off here is that it cuts out some of the light, so instead of shooting at ISO 400, sometimes you might be shooting at something like 160 or something like that, so you need it to compensate accordingly. Tip number two, freeze your film. Well, I mean, you don't necessarily have to freeze it, but you can refrigerate it and keep that in mind. When you buy food, you're most likely going to put it in the fridge if it's something that's organic or will expire sooner or later. Film's the same thing. When you buy your film, it's got an expiration date, so you need to find a way to actually try to preserve it. What many photographers do is they buy freezers and they put the film inside the freezers. Then when they take them out, they let it thaw for a little while before they actually go ahead and they use it again. If you're buying film, go ahead and put it in the freezer and let it stay and last for a little bit longer. Otherwise, you can use the fridge and in most cases, it'll be fine. If you're shooting instant film though, don't put that in the freezer. Put it in the fridge. The problem with instant film is that when it gets too cold, the chemicals don't tend to go through the actual image. So when the film is being ejected via the rollers, all of the chemicals are frozen solid. So they don't move at all, and therefore you just kind of get a wasted photo. Film has one ISO setting, and when you go to develop the film, you have to find a way to push or pull the entire roll. It's usually not very simple for you to find a way to pull one image or push one image. You're gonna have to do that in the darkroom individually through dodging and burning. So if you're shooting something like Kodak Portra 400, you can shoot it at 200 and then develop it at 320 to get the best colors. Or you can shoot it at just 200 and then develop for 200 or shoot it at 800 and develop for 800. It's really up to you. But whatever you do, shoot a film at a specific ISO and stick to it throughout the entire roll. Don't try to change it in the middle of the roll. Try to spot meter a whole scene to get the best results. Usually what happens in digital is a lot of photographers, they take the digital image, they bring it into Lightroom or Capture One, and then they pull the highlights or they push the shadows. It's really easy to do that because, well, it's digital. But with film, it's kind of harder to do that, especially if you're actually taking the film to a lab to get them to try to do it. What you'd have to do is you'd usually have to burn the highlights or dodge the shadows in some way and sometimes it's not really possible even though film has a lot of latitude. So to counter this, what you can do is you can spot meter the entire scene. Take a look at what the metering is for the highlights and then take a look at what it is for the shadows and then take a look at the average metering overall and try to figure out the best setting to be at. Now here's a big one. Once you've loaded film inside, don't open the back of the camera. The reason why is because you're then going to expose the entire roll of film and it's most likely useless unless you're doing this in some sort of changing bag or you're doing it in a dark room. So that can mean that an entire roll 
of 36 images can suddenly just disappear like that. Or an entire roll of 120 film can just kind of disappear. Here's a cool trick that one of my mentors taught me. When you've loaded some film into a camera, go ahead and advance it. And then, if your camera has a rewind dial or knob of some sort, pull it back just a little bit. You can tell your film is actually advancing by shooting an image, then advancing the film, and then seeing if the rewind knob does actually move. If it's not moving, then there's a chance that, you know, your film actually isn't advancing at all. But if it is moving and it is turning around, then you know that the film is advancing and you can keep shooting with no problems. Medium format film. Well, there's a lot to 120 film, actually, overall. 35mm film is often shot in one format. There are some formats, like X-Pan, that let you shoot panoramic, and Sprocket, that let you do a lot more, but most of it's actually 36 exposures. But with 120 film, you get a lot more than that. 120 film is a lot different than 35mm film, because not only is it larger, but it accommodates to a whole bunch of different formats. With the 645 format, you're going to get the most images, but you're also going to get the smallest negative. With the 6.9 format, though, you're going to get larger images, but less photos overall. 120 film is a film type that accommodates to many different sizes. There's 645, there's 66, there's 67, there's 645, in some rare cases there's 68. There's also 6x12. It goes up to a really, really large format. So should you get slide film or should you get negative film? Well, negative film is a lot more forgiving. You can take it into the dark room and you can usually push or pull it a lot better. And slide film, you usually get better colors, but you don't get as much versatility when it comes to editing in the dark room. Most photographers actually prefer negative film for that reason. But back in the day, a lot of photographers actually preferred slide film because it was kind of a batch of honor. Now here's one you probably didn't know. No two labs will develop your film exactly alike. If you take your film to Walgreens or Costco, and then you take it to CRC or Lomography, you'll get a different look no matter where you go. It's kind of one of the ways that labs go ahead and they market themselves. And it used to be a lot more competitive back in the day because you needed master chemists running these things. But these days, it's a little less competitive in a way because there are less labs out there. Because of this you often have to go out there and experiment with different labs and see what they do and figure out which one actually works best for you. Just keep in mind your lab that's on the corner of your block won't do the same job that the lab in the big city will. The My Light Meter app is something that I've been using for a couple of years now. It lets me meter an entire scene at a specific focal length and then figure out what it would be if I took average metering, or if I metered for the highlights, or if I metered for the shadows, I can change the ISO, the shutter speed, the aperture, everything else. It works out pretty well. Well, that's it. Those are 10 analog photography tips for digital photographers. I'm Chris Gampett, and thanks a lot.